The Scarlet Witch version of Russell Dutterman's Costumes cover series was used as the variant for Avengers Forever No. 1, which was released way back in December 2021. This cover features Wanda in 18 costumes spanning her impressive comic book career, but that's not where the costume fun ends. Since Wanda is one of Russell's favorite characters, he drew up six more individual fan art pieces of Wanda too. These poses show Wanda in costumes that she wore outside of comic book media, covering some of her animated television and MCU appearances. Even though they weren't on the original cover, for the sake of this video, I'm going to count them in my ranking here, which means that we have a whopping 24 Scarlet Witch costumes to get through. That is a lot of red. Oh my God. I'll be honest, I was hesitant even to do a Scarlet Witch costume ranking in the first place, only because I consider her to be like a tertiary X character at best. She did debut in an X-Men comic as part of Magneto's Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, so at least her roots are there, and she does have infamous ties to the X-Universe, first as Magneto's biological daughter turned daughter in name only, thank you very much MCU, and then of course for her role in the decimation of the mutant population, so part of her will forever be associated with the X-Men, but by and large, the Scarlet Witch is an Avengers character through and through. That team is where pretty much all of her character development has been, so to say that Wanda belongs as part of an X character ranking series is really stretching things for me here. But regardless of her Avengers status, and even given the brevity that she is featured in X books, her impact on the X universe is like almost second to none. So for that reason, I'm giving her a pass here and letting her join the illustrious ranks of the other X ranked costume crusaders that I've done. I have some knowledge of most Marvel comics, none of the other ones even come close to the depths of knowledge I have about X-Men though, so ranking these costumes of hers involved a lot more research than is usual for me in terms of getting to know who Wanda was during these periods of her life. Typically, I just rank these costumes aesthetically as per my personal tastes, although some people might accuse me of having no taste to begin with given some of my choices, but I do always think it's fun to peek into the psyches of the character during all of the various incarnations, and every now and again, sometimes that can sway my decision making and where each costume lands, especially if there are two costumes that look strikingly similar, which in Wanda's case, is almost all of them. I do like Wanda, though I would never be able to say she's been a favorite of mine. Her power of altering probability to meet her needs always felt so wishy-washy to me, and while it can be fun to watch a pipe valve suddenly burst if she needs to douse a flame or something, I just never really got into her. I do think she's a very well-developed character now, as she's been through a lot, and it's only through struggle that characters become interesting anyway, but I just think that for most of her career, she was too much of like a yes person for me to really be on her side. I generally gravitate towards the wild cards, and granted, Wanda can certainly be as unpredictable as her powers, but for the most part, she just felt like a good soldier who fell in line, or who wanted a nuclear family, and that is just something I cannot relate to. I think some of her strongest periods were during her quote-unquote unhinged times, which I hate to put it all on the crazy as being her most captivating story points, but just like her sis Lorna Dane, what else have they got? I think the comics have done a great job of rebuilding her image, though, and washing all of the bad memories of her past away, and truly these days, she does feel a lot more capable and confident, and is finally done being apologetic to the mutants. Her penance was one that was well served, but I'm happy to see everyone move on past M-Day now as well. In any case, she's been in the comics a long, long time, so there's lots to discuss as we dig into ranking 24 costumes worn by the Scarlet Witch. Number 24, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Blech, the Brotherhood costume. This one is just the worst. This is what Wanda wore during her debut in X-Men number 4. She and her brother Quicksilver were members of Magneto's Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, along with Mastermind and Toad. Astra was kind of part of it too, but that's a retcon for another time. In her early days, Wanda was a total accessory to Magneto's evil agenda of mutant superiority, and the Brotherhood would commit crimes of terrorism, like overthrowing human governments in order to achieve his goal. Wanda's heart was never really in this though, and she only went along with Magneto's plots because she owed him a debt for having saved her life from an angry mob of villagers whose houses she accidentally set on fire one time. 
Wanda openly argued with Mags during her tenure with the Brotherhood, and sometimes she would actively work against him and thwart him so that his scheme would fail from the inside. Wanda did not stay a member of the Brotherhood for very long, and in X-Men number 11, she and her brother quit in order to join the Avengers. She was hesitant to join them, only because being part of a team had brought nothing but turmoil for her, but Quicksilver convinced her that this was their chance to redeem themselves after having been exploited by Magneto, and after some vetting by Iron Man, the two were officially named as the Avengers' newest recruits in Avengers number 16. Now, I think this is one of the ugliest costumes I've ever seen. I've never liked it, not even from when I was a kid, and honestly, it has never grown on me. At the end of the day, it all comes down to that headpiece she's wearing. It's probably one of the most tragic things to ever disgrace a superhero's closet. It's bulky, it's awkward, and something about its construction just reminds me of Triface from The NeverEnding Story 2. Like, I'm waiting for her head to spin around inside of it and reveal a new face. I liked how take charge Wanda was during her anti-Brotherhood crusades, even while she was part of said Brotherhood, but even that level of gumption can't save her from how attacked I feel by having to look at that headpiece. Number 23, House of M. This was the costume that Wanda wore during the time she reshaped reality into the House of M, which was a reality where mutants were the majority population and humans were the minority. Basically, everything her father Magneto could have ever hoped for. In the House of M, everyone forgot who they really were, and Wanda was able to live with her family and her two kids in the peace that she had been searching for. Of course, not everyone forgot their identities though, and as all the heroes started to remember the world as they actually came from, they attacked Magneto Citadel thinking it was he who was behind everything, but they were shocked to discover the plan to reshape reality actually came from their friend Quicksilver. Even Magneto was shocked, and just like the patient father he is well known to be, he angrily lashed out and killed him, which was basically the tipping point for Wanda. She and Quicksilver were always close, and especially in this reality, with her mental stability already on the fritz, seeing him die really sent her over the edge. Even though she created this reality for mutants to live in the utmost harmony with one another, she was rocked by the fact that everyone was still finding reasons to fight and wreak havoc, so she figured the problem must lie with the mutant population itself, so the only way to deal with it was to utter those three fateful words, no more mutants. With that, the House of M came undone, and everyone returned to the prime reality, which was now a world that had a few million less mutants in it than it began with. Afterwards, Wanda disappeared for a long, long while, and with good reason, because no one was all too happy with her. This saga of the Scarlet Witch lives in infamy as one of her biggest claims to shame in the X-World, and she suffered being labeled a pariah in the mutant community for like a solid 15 years or so afterwards. Tensions between the X-Men and the Avengers were high ever since, and though Wanda has since tried to make up for her lapse in judgment on numerous occasions, the grudge was never truly buried until now, during the Krakoan era, where Wanda has created a mystical realm called the Waiting Room, where spirits of deceased mutants who didn't get backups in Cerebo can still be reborn through the resurrection protocols. Even though the House of M is such a defining moment for Wanda's comic book career, the outfit she wore during it was horrible. She was just wearing an oversized nightgown, which I guess makes sense because she was basically bedridden the entire time, so there really was no reason for her to be decked out in her super heroics. But still, the logic doesn't give this outfit a pass for me. I don't even think the nightgown is worthy of being featured on Russell Dutterman's variant cover, except it's what she was wearing at such an iconic comic book moment, so I guess, of course, he had to include it. The only part I like about this is that she's at least giving us a little slinky shoulder action, and the gold pattern detail helps break up the monotony of red, but I mean, overall, this garment is pretty hopeless. It's doing nothing for me, and so I'm doing nothing with it. Number 22, Heroes Return. This was the costume Wanda wore when the heroes returned after being sent to Franklin Richards' pocket universe during the Onslaught Crisis. Upon returning to the 616 reality, Wanda joined back up with the Avengers, who suddenly had more members than ever. She got embroiled with a bunch of drama, including being kidnapped by Morgan Le Fay, who used Wanda's reality warping powers in order to reshape the world into something more medieval. She also ended up resurrecting Wonder Man, where things got real weird between her, him, and Vision. 
The Avengers also clash with the Squadron Supreme, and Wanda pit her own magics against their team sorceress Arcana. Turns out the Squadron was under some brainwash, and Wanda used her powers to help snap them all out of it. But it wasn't all action with Wanda at this time. She also had some nice tender moments, like when she shared ice cream with Carol Danvers, who was under scrutiny by the team for being a potential imposter. Yet even though Wanda had some great moments of action and some TLC, I just can't get behind this costume she was wearing. It's a version of her Old Faithful, so the cape and the red bodice and the pink tights are all fine, but what I cannot get behind is those boots. They are the ugliest things I've seen, almost as ugly as that Brotherhood head habit. I think it's the design on like the shin area that I just can't stand. Perhaps they're an homage to her father Magneto because they kind of look like metal rings, but to me, they just stick out like a sore thumb on an otherwise okay costume. Even though I'm fine with most of the other elements, being nitpicky is what these rankings is all about, and something else I don't like about it is the cape being attached to the tip of her cleavage. It feels like a weird spot for the cape, and not very stable at all, especially not if she ever, like, god forbid, bent over. She appeared a few times without the cape, which actually made the costume somehow look even worse with just her exposed shoulders, because my eyes go directly then to those boots. She didn't keep this version of the costume for very long, bless, and even though most of her classic costumes look a little something like this, I can honestly say I was not a fan of this particular version whatsoever, even if I did enjoy her character portrayal while she was wearing it. Number 21, Avengers United They Stand. This outfit is what Wanda wore during the Avengers United They Stand animated series. In that series, Wanda was teamed up with Ant-Man, the Wasp, Wonder Man, Tigra, Hawkeye, the Falcon, and Vision to fight off evil threats and save the world as Avengers are known to do. It ran for one season from 1999 to 2000, and in it, the team fought off all of the usual suspects like Ultron, Kang, and the Masters of Evil. I was on the cusp between elementary school and junior high when the show came out, so part of me was excited for it, but another part of me was ready to move out of the world of cartoons and onto bolder things like freaks and geeks, so I admit I didn't watch much of it. I think I watched an episode or two on Teletoon and thought, eh, it's not for me, and didn't tune in for the rest. It is on Disney Plus though, if I or anyone else out there ever gets the urge. I can't precisely say why I didn't like the series, but I think a part of it might have been because of the drastic redesign of the characters. A lot of them looked way off model to me, including Wanda, whose red and purple color scheme I really didn't understand. I can't be alone in thinking that this hardcore clashes. To me, the purple feels like it was added in to appease a producer who knows nothing about design's note or something. Like, someone who felt that her actual comic book costume had too much red and it would be a turnoff to viewers of television. As far as I can tell, Wanda wasn't really a focal point of the series, at least not in the kind of way that Jean Grey eventually became for the X-Men cartoons. She does have an adventure of her own in one of the episodes where she tries to find Agatha Harkness, but other than that, I think Wanda was mostly a secondary character in the series. And I mean, who can blame them given what she was wearing? Number 20, Age of Apocalypse. It's not very usual that I find an outfit in the AOA that I don't enjoy. Most of them were so dark and edgy and starkly different from their 616 counterparts that I was just like head over heels for all of them. But when it comes to Wanda Maximoff, yeah, I'll pass on this one too. Wanda didn't really have a huge role to play in any of the actual plot points of the Age of Apocalypse comic books, but she was an important figure in its lore. In this reality, she and Quicksilver are still Magneto's children, and they join his first incarnation of X-Men, hence why it looks like she's wearing an X-Men training uniform here. Because she is. In an homage to the actual first X-Men outfits in the 616 world, Magneto decked his students out in a similar aesthetic, albeit with a red and yellow color scheme instead of a blue and yellow one. Wanda was seen training with the others in the danger room, and then after Mystique left Rogue into Magneto's care, she was seen as one of the first people to give Rogue a warm welcome, and she gave her a tour of the Wondergore facilities where their base was stationed. In another homage to the original X-Men, Apocalypse's horsemen were attacking Cape Citadel's nuclear weaponry, which is where Magneto attacked in X-Men issue number one, so Magneto gathered his X-Men to defend the base on their first mission, but told Wanda to stay back and care for the other students just in case something were to happen to him. 
It was all kind of a trap anyway, as another one of Apocalypse's acolytes named Nemesis was laying in wait for the X-Men to leave, and when they did, he attacked Wondergore and killed mostly everybody he could inside of it. Wanda was seen trying to lead the younger students to safety, but at the end of the day, she couldn't save herself, and she was among the many casualties of Nemesis' attack. Even though he was incised to defend the world and defeat Apocalypse beforehand, I think this moment of his daughter passing away is what really gave Magneto the drive to give the dream his all. Unfortunately for Wanda's time in the AOA, we didn't get to see her graduate to a full costume, and all we got to see was her in this training outfit. I don't really have as much of a soft spot for the training outfits as other people do out there, and I think for the most part they are really, really ugly. I am happy, at least, that these outfits chose red instead of blue to be their secondary color, as I mean, obviously, red is Wanda's color. Even though this is an improvement over the training uniforms of the 616, it doesn't really give me anything exciting to look at, so I don't think very highly of it. A different version of it, kinda sorta, showed up in Uncanny X-Force number 19.1 when the AOA was revisited and some Wanda clones were found in hopes that they could be used to depower that world's mutants. In it, she's wearing the exact same color scheme as the training uniform, but with a slight redesign and minus any of the X paraphernalia. She's also adorned with the classic Scarlet Witch headpiece, and even though this thing is similar in pretty much every way as the training uniform, I actually like the second one a lot better. It's a sleek bodysuit design, kind of similar to what Genosian mutates are forced to wear, but its simplicity paired with the fancy headpiece is really what attracts me to the whole getup, and I'd be tempted to rank it a bit higher here if this was the one that was on the cover. But alas, the second version wasn't the version that was chosen for the cover, so we are not ranking it, and the classic training suit gets a big ol' number 20 from me. Number 19, WandaVision. I thought WandaVision was so great. I haven't watched a ton of the MCU's TV stuff, but I followed WandaVision every week, and I was totally captivated by the story. I loved the way each episode changed eras, and right whenever I was like, alright, I'm ready for something different, it switched gears, and the creepy side of the whole series started coming to light. The show has some loose ties to some various plot points in comics, like in the Vision and Scarlet Witch miniseries where the two retire and she has her kids, and in the aforementioned House of M storyline where Wanda cracks and creates an entire alternate reality for herself and everyone around her. The show took these ideas and rolled with them and gave Wanda Vision Wanda the family she had always desired, but at the cost of an entire city's free will. I just think heroes are their best when they are bad, and watching Wanda skirt the line between good and evil here makes her character so much more interesting than just her being the girl with the in and out accent who can move things with red power. WandaVision was the debut of the Scarlet Witch's more classic comic book attire. Before this, she was mostly regulated to wearing trench coats, but now we finally got to see her don the famous Scarlet Witch headband. I think they did a really great job of doing her costume justice for a modern day look. It's hard to have her wearing something like she does in the comics and have her taken seriously on a TV screen, so giving her red corset that tough kind of leathery feel but still making it a little sexy with the exposed arms I think does a great job of representing its comic book counterpart. I don't think I care as much for this rendition of her costuming though when it's drawn. It kind of lacks the toughness that it has in person versus seeing it on the page. But as far as a standard superhero live action comic book type costume goes, I think they did a really great job designing it. Number 18, Multiverse of Madness. I mean, this is basically the same costume, right? Wanda in the Multiverse of Madness proved to be a very enjoyable villain for me, cause as with all great villains, she wasn't inherently evil. She was misguided and just wanted what she thought was unfairly taken from her, her children. It led to some poor decision making on her part, and eventually she saw that the extremes she was going to weren't exactly the best choices overall, but I mean, a girl's gotta do what a girl's gotta do. This was such a great follow-up portrayal after WandaVision, and was probably my favorite Wanda in the MCU to date. The outfit is essentially exactly the same as her WandaVision outfit, except she has covered herself up more and taken away those fleshy arm spots that I liked, and replaced them with some more of that diabolically evil red fabric. Normally, I'm like, more skin to win, but here, I just feel like the evilness that oozes from those specific shades of red really hammers home who I want this character to be, and that is one badass witch. 
the darker the imagery, the more likely you are to get on my good side. So for that reason, this costume just barely scooches on past WandaVision for the number 18 spot. Number 17, Unity Squad outfit number 2. This was the outfit Wanda wore during the second incarnation of the Avengers Unity Squad, where she and Quicksilver spent most of their time trying to figure out their heritage after learning that Magneto wasn't their father and that they weren't even mutants at all. During the Axis event, the Scarlet Witch became the queen of all chaos magic and cursed her bloodline so that anyone related to her would become incapacitated. It worked and Pietro was immediately affected, but Magneto pursued unscathed, which could only mean one thing to Wanda, that he was in fact not her father at all, and that the past several decades of comic book lore have been one big lie to everybody. After the inversion was inversed, and mostly everyone resumed their original attitudes, Wanda and Pietro traveled to visit the High Evolutionary to see if he could give them any background information on their lives since they grew up in Wondagore Mountain. That's when they learned that, in addition to Magneto not being their father, they also weren't mutants either, and were instead just genetic experimentations made to look like mutants on a molecular level, undoing yet another staple of comic book legend. I mean, the Magneto retcon was enough, but to demutant them too? Marvel has gone too far. All these changes were of course to satisfy legal requirements for the MCU, which prohibited the use of mutants in the main Avengers franchise due to Fox's claim over any and all X-Men-isms, including mutants. I'm not sure if I read that somewhere, or if it's just such an obvious case that it has to be the case, but basically by demutanting Wanda and Pietro in the comics, it created a legal loophole for Marvel to use them as characters in the movies, since if they are not mutants, then they thus do not fall within the realm of X-Men anymore. I think most X-Fans revile this retcon, and would welcome a retcon of the retcon, and to be honest, I thought we were going to get something like that during the Trial of the Scarlet Witch miniseries. Oh, sorry, the Trial of Magneto miniseries. I thought for sure Wanda had struck a deal to be resurrected as a mutant, which would basically just render all the previous retcons null, but alas, it wasn't to be the case, and now she is just a mutant ally as opposed to being a part of the big extended mutant family herself. Anyway, after confronting the High Evolutionary, she and Pietro also learned that they had a sister named Luminous. Luminous was created by the big HG himself, who used the genetic templates of the twins to do so, meaning that she had not only her own powers, but also the powers of both Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch combined. Luminous was pretty powerful, and neither Quickie nor Scarlet could take her down by themselves, but after reuniting with the rest of the Avengers and taking on all of the High Evolutionary's forces together, they managed to subdue not only Luminous, but also High Evolutionary too. So, I'm not a huge fan of these storylines for Wanda, only because to me, they seem to undo more character enrichment than they create. But it's suitable that she's wearing this outfit for them, because I don't really like this outfit that much either. There's nothing outright ghastly about it, but I just find it to be too restrictive for her. And specifically, I'm referencing that mini capelet that just drapes across her chest and shoulders. It looks tight and restrictive of her movements, and like it would just get in the way. I also don't really think that her top and her pants match that well either. The corset looks like it's got a very firm structure, while the pants remind me of like Lululemon form-fitting jeggings. So the silhouette is creating like a, a contrast of angular comfort that's a bit off-putting for me. It's not unusual to see Wanda in this kind of top, as most of her other outfits have a very similar version of this, but I think the color here and the costume, but make it casual nature of the parts together, don't really give her the strike fear into my enemy's vibe that it should be going for. Number 16, X-Men Evolution. The X-Men Evolution series was the next animated series to be produced after the original X-Men animated series of the 90s wrapped up. Like its predecessor, this series was pretty successful, and it ran for four seasons from the year 2000 to 2003. This series was way more different than the X-Men TAS series though, as it had reimagined a lot of the characters to be high school students, which is where a lot of the story action would take place, meaning that the mutants not only had to worry about saving the world, but also had to remember to pass in their algebra homework on time too. The high school setting wasn't really for me, so I didn't tune in to watch this when the show aired initially, but my personal attitude toward it has softened over the years now, and I think it was a decent follow-up series to the original, which for me remains the holy grail of all X-Men cartoon series ever. In this world, Wanda was an angsty, rebellious teenage witch. She was put into an institution by her father Magneto at an early age, and pretty much her entire character arc through line in the series is about how she wants revenge on him because of that. 
She joins Mystique's Brotherhood and goes against the X-Men a few times, but she's never able to fully get the vengeance that she sought against her father. In the end, Magneto uses Mastermind's powers to rewire Wanda's memories so that she forgets that she hates him and so that they can be a loving family once more. Yep, it's pretty twisted, but I mean, that's great storytelling. I really like Wanda's portrayal in the series, even though she is somewhat of a one-track-minded character. Literally, her entire existence is about her revenge story against Magneto, so I wouldn't say that she's the most robust of the characters, but the series does a good enough job of keeping her fresh with a few twists here and there so that the storyline itself, though unchanging, never really feels old episode after episode. I have a deep appreciation for how Wanda dresses in this series. Her costume is like rebellious goth kid incarnate. The long trench coat and the distressed ripped up pants are like staples of a punky counterculture and she's accentuating the whole thing with heavy red lips and the palest of skin just to show how deeply committed she is to doing this whole new persona justice. This reminds me a lot of Feruza Bulk's Nancy character from The Craft, especially the giant necklace she's sporting, which I think was the production company's way of getting away with something that is somewhat crucifixy in a children's show. There are lots of pop cultural references in this series, like when Kitty and Ro go dancing and it homages Buffy and Faith dancing in an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So the fact that this Scarlet Witch reminds me of another witch within pop culture is far too much of a coincidence to be wrong, right? I think her costuming goes the distance in terms of communicating Wanda's state of mind during the series, and also as a way of communicating what sort of clique Wanda would belong to in a high school setting, because as soon as you see her, you definitely can point and say, I know who that girl is. Number 15, Ultimates Wanda. In the Ultimate Universe, Wanda started off as a member of Magneto's Brotherhood, similarly to what happened in the 616 world. But through a series of misadventures, she eventually ended up in S.H.I.E.L.D. custody, where Nick Fury offered her and her brother membership to the Ultimates. The Ultimates were essentially the Ultimate Universe's version of the Avengers, as it had members like Black Widow, Hawkeye, Iron Man, Thor, and so on. Even though Wanda and Quicksilver were known mutant terrorists at this point, they struck a deal with S.H.I.E.L.D. to work for them under a quid pro quo basis, in that S.H.I.E.L.D. would help to free certain political prisoners that might further the Brotherhood's agenda, and in exchange, the Ultimates would be able to make use of the Twins' powers. As a member of the Ultimates, Wanda was somewhat of a wild card, not always showing up for battle, but when she did, she was always very useful. She used her powers to disarm another giant set of missiles and got in the faces of the X-Men again when they tried to stop the Ultimates from doing their jobs. Nick Fury also had her apprehend this universe's version of Longshot, which was an interesting battle because their powers of probability altering kind of countered each other and it threw Longshot's luck off. She helped the Ultimates fight off some alien invaders and was responsible for bringing Thor back to the team in order to fight Loki, and she joined up with a bunch of the other Ultimate superheroes when the Squadron Supreme invaded. She had some awesome looking showdowns with the Mystic Arcana from that group, and she ended up being responsible for actually doubling the problem and bringing another version of the Squadron to the battle when she was trying to get rid of the first one. Only through working with both Arcanas was Wanda actually able to perfect the spell and send all the Squadrons back to the worlds that they came from. Wanda's characterization in the Ultimate Universe has her being somewhat more cold and sharper than her 616 counterpart. It's an aggressive side of her that I actually really like to see, and certainly by the end of her character's run, she was playing nice with the team, but also still looking out for numbers one and one, which is of course herself and her brother. Wanda was killed in the third volume of the Ultimates when a bullet was shot and it struck her in the middle of the street. Quicksilver wasn't fast enough to save her, and it was revealed that the killer was actually a robot that she had flirted with a while ago, and whose programming she accidentally altered after having touched it. The robot was an Ultron unit, and it grew into a jealous rage after it realized that Wanda would never reciprocate its feelings that it felt for her, because she was already involved with somebody else, that person being her brother Quicksilver. Yes, throughout her entire Ultimate Universe depiction, she and Pietro are characterized as being extremely close siblings with each other. And though it may not be totally unusual for siblings to hold hands here and there and take romantic rides on the Venice gondolas from time to time, it became apparent that there was more going on here than just brotherly sisterly love, and Wolverine confirmed it during a flashback episode where he was working for Magneto and stumbled across the twins having... Um, a sensitive moment with each other. 
Take from all of that what you will, but it's definitely one of the more controversial choices for the edgy Ultimate Universe. After her death, it looked like Wanda might have briefly made a return as she somehow resurfaced and was ordering Quicksilver to infiltrate the government and make nice with Magneto, but it just ended up being an illusion created by Apocalypse and Wanda was still dead after all. So now, talking about this outfit, well, first things first, it's hella simple. It's literally just a tube top and pants, maybe some gloves too, depending on the day. The top looks like it was lined with some fun tubing or something, I don't know what it is. I guess it's like an armor plate, maybe? And even though that's pretty much the extent of the zhuzhing here, I can't help but kinda like it. I think I enjoy the simplicity in it, because the temptation obviously is to add a necklace here, or god forbid a headpiece, but by not doing any of that, it totally makes this outfit different and unique and sets it apart from the sometimes over-the-top accessorizing that she tends to do with her other outfits. The pants that she wears is sometimes all red or sometimes red and black, and I must say that I prefer the red-black version because it helps to throw a bit of color in there and helps break up all the other red and is an easy way to give the look a bit of depth without resorting to the usual accoutrement to do so. Part of me wants to call this design lazy and sexist and just totally not practical for a superhero to wear, but I think it really falls in line with Wanda's personality from the Ultimate Universe. She didn't really give a ton of shits about anything. She just wanted to get what she wanted, and this is definitely the outfit to wear for someone who doesn't give a damn about what anybody else thinks of them, especially not some guy ranking her outfits. Number 14, Romani Wanda. This outfit was the second one that Wanda wore during the Avengers Volume 3 series. When she first wore it, she was actually a prisoner of Morgan Le Fay, and it had only manifested on her body because Morgan had transformed the world into an old-school medievalish landscape where everyone and everything was wearing a more appropriate outfit of the times. With Wanda having Romani heritage, it made sense that this was the costume that she was magicked into, and not soon after defeating Morgan did she decide to actually wear it full-time in order to keep in touch with her roots. Wanda was definitely one of the central players in the Avengers during the early part of this series and while she was wearing this costume. Her life was basically one giant soap opera as she was caught up in a strange love triangle between herself, Vision, and the kinda dead, kind of alive Wonder Man. Wanda had discovered that her hex power had the ability to conjure Wonder Man back from the dead anytime she wanted to, but it was only ever a temporary summoning and she was hesitant to use it because she didn't want Simon to be seen as a weapon and not as a person. This actually put her in direct conflict with Captain America, who ordered her to conjure Simon during a fight against Silverclaw, but she refused straight up. The closest X-equivalent I can think of in terms of the storyline is during Volume 4 of Uncanny X-Men, when Psylocke could control the Archangel drone that was created after Clan Akaba had purified Warren of the Archangel persona entirely. She wasn't totally aware that this wasn't Warren at the time, even though he was just like a mindless creature, but that didn't stop her or Magneto from unleashing him whenever they wanted to, which was certainly an ethical quagmire before they finally found the real Warren clean and pure and utterly whole before he ultimately merged with the Archangel Persona again. But anyway, during this period of Wanda's life, she was constantly failing the Bechtel test, and almost every panel was her fretting about her feelings for Simon or hurting the vision because of said feelings. Eventually, after some guidance from Agatha, she learned that she could tap into chaos magic, which I think was the first time this term was coined for her, and eventually, through harnessing all of that and giving into her emotions, she managed to resurrect Wonder Man full time so that she didn't have to conjure him anymore, and the two of them started dating. Also during this time, she was voted as the interim leader of the group, but it didn't last very long and she admittedly wasn't very good at it, as she just didn't really have the on-field knowledge of how to coordinate attacks and during a fight against the weird villain Pagan and Lord Templar, some of her decisions caused more harm than good. Captain America even undermined her a bit, which couldn't have been great for her confidence, so way to go Cap. But ultimately, Wanda decided that he should have control of the missions anyway since he has the experience, and that she would remain on as the morale officer, handling more of the day-to-day -day and personal issues of the team, which seemed to suit her just fine. 
Those were pretty much her major storylines during this period, though we did see her in action a bunch too. She fought against Silverclaw and Moses Magnum and the Grim Reaper and some resurrected dead Avengers and even Ultron for a bit. Wanda was a very strong, self-assured character at this point, even if her portrayal kind of did her a bit of an injustice. She talked a lot about men and had shaky belief in her leadership abilities, but other than that, she really had it together and it was a nice, stable breath of fresh air for her. In terms of the outfit, it's definitely another one of her more revealing ones. It's like her Ultimate Universe costume, but remixed a bit with a cape, a long skirt, and all the accessories you can imagine. Where the Ultimate Universe costume had none, this one really piled them on. I know it's a nod to her heritage, so I can't fault it for that, but in my opinion, it definitely fails the Coco Chanel test of forgetting to take off one thing before leaving the house. I love a perm and a curly hairdo, but this hair was really giving me felicity realness to the point where I thought it was just a bit too frizzy to even look good. When the hair feels like it has a mind of its own, it's time to tame it back into submission, and I feel like this hair could have used a little bit more discipline. Even though I think the accessories and the hair are a bit all over the top, and that the costume is a tad sexier than I even want it to be, I still can't help but kind of like it, just because I feel like it really is giving me a lot of that camp energy that I love in comics. I don't know if it was meant to do that, but that's what it does, and it's a solid middle-of-the-pack ranking for me. Number 13, Avengers Disassembled. The Avengers Disassembled arc is another one of Wanda's most infamous storylines. During this period, Wanda was going through a bit of a mental breakdown and was taking her stress out on her teammates whom she blamed for the death of her children. The Wasp had unintentionally brought up the kids in conversation about how they never truly existed in the first place, but the memory of her dead kids had long been purged by Agatha Harkness, so she didn't really know what the Wasp was talking about. The comment triggered something though, and eventually Wanda did remember her kids and a chain of events unfolded that saw her blame the Avengers for taking them from her and her using her powers to seek revenge against them. She caused all sorts of chaos to happen, like causing Jack of Hearts to explode and destroy the mansion and kill Ant-Man, and a bunch of Ultrons and Kree soldiers to fight the Avengers, and her influence even got She-Hulk to rip the Vision in half. After Doctor Strange figured out what was going on, he had to magically subdue Wanda, and eventually Magneto came to claim her, and he whisked her away to Genosha to tend to her mental state. The X-Men and the Avengers brainstormed ways to help her, but no one knew what to do but a problem called Wanda, and they actually debated killing her so that what happened would never happen again. But before any of them got the chance to do anything at all, Quicksilver leaked the plan to Wanda and convinced her to warp reality to create the House of M. The whole arc ushered in the end of the Avengers as we knew them, and it was basically a prelude to the whole House of M, No More Mutants fiasco. Avengers Disassembled is truly a devastating and heartbreaking story arc, but I think it's one of the strongest ones of all time, and I really enjoyed how ruthless Wanda was in exacting her vengeance on the Avengers. The storyline is marred a bit in my opinion, because there's somewhat of a retcon attempt during the Avengers Children's Crusade arc, where it was stated that Wanda had been manipulated by Doctor Doom during all the events, and that her nervous breakdown was orchestrated by him, and it was actually him who was using her powers to warp reality. In my opinion, that kind of ruins the whole legacy of the long-lasting effects of this story, so I personally choose not to take that as true, and instead ought to believe that the real Doctor Doom manipulation is that he's happening to lie here when he's saying all this to Wanda. Anyway, in terms of her outfit during this era, I really liked what she was wearing. As with most of her outfits, it is hitting notes of a familiar theme, but I like the subtle changes that she added. Her corset looks armored and strong and protective, even though it does kind of give her a crustaceous lobster-like belly. I also like all of the padding that she's wearing, like on her elbows and on her knees, because who wants to fall down and scrape up any of those sensitive areas while fighting off some supervillains? The Russell Dowderman version of this outfit doesn't show the pink bodysuit that she mostly wore underneath the red all the time, and even though I'm never one to disparage a boob window, I actually think I prefer the costume with the pink underneath. As I've said before, and will say again, it's a lot of red when it comes to the Scarlet Witch's costuming, so any sort of color pop is usually welcomed by me just to help break it up a bit. 
Wanda had a very mysterious air about her during this era, even before the whole mental breakdown bit. Before that, she was still a member in good standing with the Avengers, and she was working with them on the battlefield and doing lots of good things for the world, like using her hex powers to safeguard a community from a bunch of bioweapons that were deployed by the Red Skull, and battling the likes of the Wrecking Crew and the Thunderbolts, and keeping She-Hulk calm when she was She-Hulking out. She would often have her giant cape wrapped all around her, and like a spooky witchy vibe, which obviously goes great with her code name. It reminded me of like a mix of what Cloak always does when he's just standing ominously still, or like what Rogue was doing during the Supernova's arc when she had her giant green heavy looking cloak that she just kept wrapping around her body all the time. Wanda's cloak worked well for the wraparound phase of this era, and especially when she did crack and start to attack her friends, it made her look all the more menacing, albeit very cozy at the same time. Number 12, Force Works. I am a huge sucker for Force Works. It holds a very soft spot in my heart, not because the series was fantastic, but because I really like the dynamics of all the characters, including one of the oddest of them all, Old Man Century, who speaks in a vernacular of synonyms, and anyone who is as literate a tongue as he is certainly is a man after my own heart. Forceworks was an Avengers splinter group that spun out of the dissolution of the West Coast Avengers. Even though everyone had decided to go their separate ways, Tony Stark brought the Scarlet Witch, Spider-Woman, and US Agent together again and convinced them that their work wasn't quite done yet. Instead of fighting supervillains, they banded together to prevent disasters before they could even happen, which was only predictable because of Wanda's chaos magic fused with Tony Stark's technology. Wanda was actually the team's leader for Forceworks, and in my opinion, it was her first real go get a moment where she could be decisive and prove that she has what it takes to be the one calling the shots. Not everyone listened to her all the time, especially not the men, but it was still a unique opportunity for her to get practice in as a captain of a small-knit team with a unique mission statement, as opposed to being thrust into the big leagues of the global stage like when she had to lead the Avengers. Force works didn't last overly long, and a lot of the stories involved fighting outer space aliens and fighting a bunch of magical or cyber-based villains that don't really merit much mention, but some of the bigger names they fought include the Mandarin and Kang the Conqueror. Now, taking a look at this outfit she wore, my goodness, what a look. It is definitely the most revealing outfit Wanda has ever worn, and I can't help but feel like it was partially just Wanda trying to capitalize on the sexy ladies of the 90s trend. I'm not gonna lie, it kind of falls flat for me though. I'm used to Wanda having a bit more uh, pomp and circumstance in her costumes. Even though she really just wears a bunch of red all the time, there's usually like a slight ornamentation or at the very least a witchy headband. This one looks like she traded in the camp for a bit of glamour. The necklace and the little gloves are definitely less kitschy and more upscale, but the whole thing just feels a bit barren. The costume itself is just a bathing suit covered up by a sexy cut-up tunic-like thing that hides nothing to the imagination. The way it just leaves everything so exposed, I think the cut of it actually makes her look cheap as opposed to the intended sexy. There's really not much going on here, but at the very least, I do think it's commendable that she is exploring her sexuality a bit. She's come a long way from being covered up to her very chin during her first debut in that awful Brotherhood costume, so I embrace the fact that she's embracing this new discoverability period. I'm not a fan of a Scarlet Witch with short hair, but it's definitely a slicked back look that makes me want to take her seriously. And if she's going to be the leader, and if she's going to wear a whole lot of nothing like this, then at the very least, we can give the lady our attention and listen to what she has to say, and that's very much the vibe this hairstyle gives. Number 11, Pink Hips Wanda. After the Avengers were reformed post Heroes Reborn, Wanda went through a bunch of costumes with her brand new super curly hair. This was one of the last ones, and it combined aspects of both of the ones that came before it. Of course, it had all the classic Scarlet Witch silhouettes like the red bodice and the cape and the headpiece, but it also kept the jewelry from her Romani-inspired outfit. This one gets bonus points for having a fun, hip-hugging pink design, which at first I wondered if it was clashy or too aerobics instructory, but then I banged my head on the table and realized, of course it wasn't, the pink is beautiful. 
During this era, pretty much everyone was an Avenger, from Firestar to Jack of Hearts to Stingray, so it was a lot of page time to fill with characters, and I don't feel like Wanda got a ton of it. During this costume period, she and the team fought a whole bunch of hulks, and she broke off her romantic relationship with Wonder Man and helped in the fight against Kang's forces as he sought to take over the world. She was held as a prisoner in Kang's detainment camps, where she sought to help the people around her, and she managed to free Wonder Man so that he could take on Kang in space, where Kang was eventually defeated and everyone freed from prison. Wanda was also one of the few Avengers who went on a mission to space in order to help their old friend Mantis. Wanda and friends had to help her by taking on not only Thanos, but also Scary Mistress Death. During the trip, Mantis and Vision got a little friendly with each other, which gave Wanda a few pangs of jealousy, but overall, she was fine with it. I think this is a really cute costume for Wanda, and I like that it marries a few of her other ideas, but doesn't hone in too heavily on either of them. It's really fun with the pink side hips, and still sexy with her showing a bit of a bust on top. Overall, this is a lovely little costume period for Wanda, and I say it's a shame that it didn't last longer. Number 10, Wolverine and the X-Men. Wolverine and the X-Men was the successor to the X-Men Evolution cartoon. It reimagined the mutants in a world where the team disbanded after the sudden disappearance of Jean Grey and Professor X, but where eventually Wolverine works to get them back together again in order to fight a new threat. It was a really great series in my opinion, and it sucks that it only lasted for one season, because rumor has it that season 2 was going to plunge the X-Men into the Age of Apocalypse, and given the sophisticated writing and animation style of the show, I really think they would have done that storyline justice. Wanda's role in this cartoon was that of the role she usually portrays when being introduced to a new franchise, and it was as someone who's in league with her father Magneto. Luckily, we got to skip the whole Brotherhood origin storyline, and we dive straight into her being by his side in Genosha, where she helps keep the peace and maintain it as a supposed mutant paradise refuge. Genosha doesn't end up being all it's cracked up to be though, as instead of letting everyone live in harmony, Magneto hides any mutant who doesn't agree with him deep in the Genosian cells, and Wanda is actually complicit in helping him keep this as a secret, though she does it out of loyalty to her father and not out of the tyrannical ruling that he does. Ultimately, Magneto is deposed, and Wanda and Polaris take over as the nation's leaders, swearing that they'll make Genosha an actual mutant paradise and not follow in their father's footsteps. There's a trend of Wanda to be portrayed as naive in both the comics and the movie and TV show she's been in, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. On the one hand, naive people exist, so it's important representation to have out there, but on the other hand, why has she always got to be the damn dumb one? I guess the other trait she often exudes is unyielding loyalty to her family, and really, that's where her naivete stems from. She doesn't want to believe bad things about her father or brother or anybody, so oftentimes she just blissfully and ignorantly doesn't. The Wanda in this series was pretty naive, but at least she was pretty. I liked her outfit a lot, even though it's your standard run-of-the-mill Scarlet Witch garb and cape. The nice thing about this one though is that she's really giving the cape some limelight by making it look a bit asymmetrical and falling right off her shoulder. I find usually the cape is an afterthought in Wanda's costuming, but here I dare say it might be the main event. I also really like the accentuated abs on her corset bodysuit. It's no lobster belly, but it still looks like it could break a fist if anyone were ever to punch her right in the gut. Number 9, Kathan Wanda. Okay, so this is a wild costume, and I'm so happy that Russell Dowderman included it on the cover. This moment in Scarlet Witch history took place rather briefly, but famously, when the elder demon Chathan, Kathan, I have no idea how to say it, took possession of Wanda and tried to use her to break the barrier between his dimensional prison and that of planet Earth. Chathan is the writer of the Darkhold, which you may know is a very evil book of spells, and he's the one who imbued Wanda with the potential to tap into chaos magic back when she was a wee baby, so he was definitely pulling her strings for a while. Wanda's possession happened after she was kidnapped by Mordred, who was also under Chathan's thrall, and Mordred performed a spell on Wanda that permitted his master's influence to permeate throughout her. 
She was super powerful in this form and took down all the Avengers when they came to help her, but ultimately she was thwarted when her adopted daddy Django used a magic doll to siphon out the essence of Chathan that was controlling her. Chathan ended up trapped in his own dimension, though he and Wanda would face off against each other a few more times over the years. In terms of this costume, I mean, there isn't really much to say about it. It's literally just a raggedy, torn up, demonic version of her usual costume, but there is just something about that kind of look that I can't help but love. It must be the edginess that it exudes. I'm a sucker for all evil, and this is one of her most evil looking costumes of all. I love how Mephisto-y her cape is looking, and even though her pale, skeletal complexion is a bit jarring, I think it helps add a campy Halloween element to this tortured version of Wanda. It's one of those costumes that I think doesn't need to try to be practical or try to be sexy, because it exists solely to be infernal and menacing, and honestly, mission accomplished. Number 8. Ultimate Brotherhood Wanda In her first Ultimate Universe appearance, the Scarlet Witch echoed that of her main 616 debut and she was aligned with Magneto and his pro-mutant terrorist brotherhood group. During her time in that faction, she came across as like super passive and always on the receiving end of some sort of verbal abuse by Magneto. He would call her an idiot on more than one occasion, and he was just being very rude to her in a way that was like not very becoming of a leader. Unlike in the 616, Wanda and Pietro knew that Megs was their father right from the get-go here, and at one point Wanda got all Stockholm syndrome-y and would justify Magneto's abuse towards them by saying that he's only mean because they remind him of a moment of weakness in which he had sex with a human, which of course is very much a no-no in the Magneto world order. Wanda stayed with him nevertheless, and she helped in the inevitable fights against the X-Men, and was one of the only members of the team who was kind to Cyclops when he temporarily joined the Brotherhood. Eventually, it looked like Wolverine had killed Magneto, and that finally led to Wanda having to take on a more active role within the group. Under her and Quicksilver's leaderships, they helped to free the X-Men from custody in the Weapon X facility, and then actually teamed up with them to battle S.H.I.E.L.D. Unlike Magneto, who couldn't play nice with others, Wanda was actively trying to have all the mutants get along and improve mutant-human relations somewhat, even though she still took things to the extreme, like destroying an entire country's inventory of nuclear missiles, but it was just in a flex of power so that people would take them seriously. Eventually, she goes off and joins the Ultimates and becomes a better character overall, but I definitely can't say that Wanda's depiction within the Brotherhood is my favorite. She's a punching bag for Magneto and hardly has a backbone to call her own even when it looks like she's leading the team. She eventually grows one when she's working with the Ultimates, but for the first part of her character journey in the Ultimate Universe, it's a real struggle to watch. The one shining light of this moment in time for her though is this costuming. It's a sexified version of her 616 Scarlet Witch costume, and I must say, I didn't realize how much more effective her whole color scheme could look with a merely different colored hair. She's got some raven locks as opposed to the chestnut brown that we're accustomed to, and I think it's a great color on her. Definitely it makes her look more like a vixen. My favorite part of the actual costume, though, is the baggy sleeves. They're a bit reminiscent of the ladies' costuming from the AOA timeline, where such styled sleeves were all the rage, and even though these big cutouts right below her armpits don't serve any real function except for maybe ventilation, I appreciate that she's bringing us some drama here, and if we aren't looking for drama, then why would we bother looking at all? Number 7. All New, All Different Wanda this is the costume that Wanda wore during her first real ongoing solo series. In this solo series, Wanda was predominantly motivated to discover her family tree. After years of falsely believing herself to be Magneto's daughter, she went on a quest to track down her real roots, and she did so by connecting with her dead mother, and also by fighting magical beings and doing magical things. There were some strange things going on with witchcraft around this time, and every time she used her powers, her lifespan was getting shorter and shorter. But with the help of her mom and her good friend Agatha Harkness, Wanda put a stop to the war on magic and saved it for all magic wielders everywhere. During this period, she was also a reserve Avengers Unity Squad member, 
but she wasn't welcomed back to the main roster with open arms because she was deemed as being too unreliable. That was okay with her because it gave her time to explore a budding romance with Dr. Voodoo, and for a while, they were the hot new item. Wanda was particularly into that relationship because she felt like Jericho could respect her both as a woman and as a sorceress, which is something her past non-magical flames like Vision and Wonder Man couldn't really do. Eventually, Wanda rejoined the main Avengers squad, and when the Secret Empire event happened and the big bad alt-timeline Steve Rogers took things over, Wanda became possessed by Chathon again and was forced to do some dirty deeds as a member of the evil Steve's evil Avengers. Doctor Strange eventually freed her, but it wouldn't be the last time she came across Chathon again. She led a team of all-star defenders against his supreme rise, but ultimately it was up to Wanda alone to take him down, and she did the unthinkable of absorbing both the Darkhold and Chathon into herself. This effectively flipped the script of what is usually a possession of her by him, because now she was the one in control. Thanks to her strength of will, she was the one acting as his cage instead of her acting as his puppet. This costume actually lasted for quite a while, right up until the Empire event of not so long ago, when she had to fight a bunch of plant monsters and save the Savage Land from infestation by the Kowati. It's actually a really nice costume, and certainly one of her most practical looking ones. I think it was a really solid modern take on what the Scarlet Witch might wear, and that it was neither too ostentatious nor too bland. I don't care for the bejeweled headpiece, it's a bit too fairy princess for my liking, but I do like that black seems to be the predominant color scheme in this outfit, and that it is accented with red, and not just any red, but a shade of red that I shockingly don't think we've ever seen her in before. The costume doesn't play a ton of homage to her most famous costume, which makes it a breath of fresh air, as since most of the other costumes on this list are just variations of a familiar theme. Wanda is a woman who is known for making bold choices now, and though not as bold as some of her other costumes or choices, I still think this outfit is a lovely addition to her wardrobe. Number 6, Unity Squad number 1. I always liked the idea of the Avengers Unity Squad. I thought it was a fun repercussion to come out of the fallout of Avengers vs. X-Men. I wouldn't say I'm an Avengers mega fan the way I am an X-Men mega fan, but there are enough characters in that franchise that I enjoy so that when a supergroup team-up title was announced, I was all for it. Uncanny Avengers had a lot of highlights, but hands down the best part of it for me was the tension between Wanda and Rogue. Rogue was extremely defensive about having Wanda on the team after M-Day, and she did not trust her in the slightest. It was especially painful for her as Professor X had just been murdered, so it felt disrespectful to his memory to have the one person who single-handedly decimated the mutant race to fight on this unity squad in the name of both human and mutant relations. Wanda played her part of the apologist for the most of the series, which is a role she has had to do for years and years with the mutant community, but even she eventually had enough of Rogue and the two exchanged more than words. The climax of their little feud happened when Rogue supposedly killed Wanda out of fear that Wanda was casting a spell to rid all the remaining mutants. That wasn't Wanda's real intention though, of course, but everyone was being manipulated by the Apocalypse Twins, so it was hard to tell who was doing the right thing. Time eventually got reversed so that Wanda never died, and Rogue became super embarrassed after hearing about her now alternate timeline murder of Wanda, so the two managed to eventually patch things up and start working together as civil Unity Squad members on the team and beyond. As a member of the Uncanny Avengers, Wanda and the squad faced all sorts of diabolical threats, like a telepathic Red Skull who implanted Professor X's brain into his own head so that he could cause mania about mutants. They also faced the Apocalypse Twins and the Celestial Exitar, who was bringing a judgment day upon the human race. The penultimate storyline of this series was the Axis event, which was when the Red Skull became a Red Onslaught, and the only way to stop him was by casting an inversion spell so that the Professor X side of his brain would take over and make him good again. Wanda and Doctor Doom casted the spell together, but it worked a little too well, and it inverted lots of the Marvel Universe's heroes and villains to switch personalities for a bit. So evil people like Sabretooth lost their bloodlust and did things like join the X-Men, while heroes like Wanda became hell-bent on revenge. 
She saw to take it all out on Dr. Doom for his past misdeeds to her, and it was during this standoff that we learned she and Quicksilver were not Magneto's real children, and what is probably one of the most reviled retcons of all time, as I've already discussed. In any effect, everyone's personalities eventually got switched back, including Wanda's, but the bombshell of her true heritage would have a very lasting effect. The Uncanny Avengers was a great time for Wanda, and I think she looked great in it. This is an awesome costume, even if it is a little bit dowdy. It's not really very sexy, but since when does sex need to sell everything? I think the trench coaty dress really works for her. It's a bit of an awkward length, and it can't quite decide exactly where it wants its slit to be, but I think what draws me to it is that it's just, again, something totally different for her that we've never really seen her in. She's always wearing pants or leggings of some sort, never really a dress, so I just thought it was a nice change of aesthetic, and I liked that they kept it simple, but also a little bit modern. It's not overly adorned with gems or belts or whatever. It's just a straight cut fabric with the illusion of an hourglass, and sometimes that's all a look needs. Number five, classic Avengers. I've been applauding the costumes that differentiate Wanda from what her usual look is, but there's no denying that the standard Scarlet Witch outfit is iconic for a reason. None of her other costumes have stood the same test of time as this one has. Granted, that's mostly because she's been unwavering and wearing nearly the same thing throughout pretty much her entire Avengers career, but sometimes it pays not to mess with a classic. She's worn slight variations of this costume throughout the years, but by and large, when you think of Wanda, you probably picture her in something like this. This was what she wore pretty much throughout the entire time during her initial Avengers run, and also when she was with the West Coast Avengers. She also had two miniseries with the Vision in this outfit, and was part of all kinds of Marvel crossover events like The Secret Wars, Atlantis Attacks, and everything Infinity Gauntlet. You could say that most of the character work that defines her has been done while she was wearing this costume, but I actually think she's one of the few characters whose modern day storylines outperform her old stuff. I really think the Scarlet Witch character came into her prime around the Avengers Disassembled and House of M period. It really feels like that was the jumping off point for the brand new Wanda, and almost like everything that happened to her before then was just kind of like swept under the rug. Maybe people just love an unstable, chaos-wielding witch, and that's why the Scarlet Witch of today gets more love than the Scarlet Witch of yore, even though she had years and years of servitude with the Avengers before ever going haywire. Some of the highlights for Wanda include her formally receiving tutelage from Agatha Harkness on how to better control and augment her powers, and the discovery that Magneto was her father, which is something that eventually got retconned, but the thing that probably stands out about Wanda the most during this era is her relationship with the Vision. This was when they first started courting each other, and they both faced prejudice from their own teammates about a human hooking up with a synthesoid. It's terrible to assert that the strongest thing to come from Wanda's publication history over this long period of time was her finding a unique lover, but in terms of storylines, it feels like so much of her character work was centralized around her romantic relationship with him and their desire to start a family. I guess because Vision is like an android, it makes the whole situation novel and a bit more appealing than if it was just her hooking up with some like regular human. But I do hate that love is the linchpin of what made Wanda's character dynamic in the 80s. Anyway, Wanda and the Vision's marriage has ups and downs full of magical pregnancies and memory wiping and all the drama you could imagine that comes with that, but they break up in the end and Wanda goes on to do bigger and better things without being attached to no mandroid. This costume of hers is a little stupid and corny, but it's quintessential Scarlet Witch. It's the debut of her famous M-shaped headband, and it's the foundation of what pretty much all of her future costumes are based on. It's really a pretty simple costume, just a full body pink leotard with a red bathing suit over it and a bunch of red accompaniments, but it's the simplicity that works for it, as I keep saying all the time. She's not overdoing it with bangles and baubles, and there's no one place trying to steal the attention from any other place. Everything works together in cohesive harmony so that you can respect and enjoy the costume in its full splendor without overlooking any one particular part. I will say that I think the tiara is a little bit 
too bulky in this rendition compared to future versions of it. It's like the one part that is attention grabbing in like the wrong way, I'd say. But that detail is fairly minor and on a whole, everything flows smoothly here from head to toe. Number four, Modern Avengers. Okay, so this costume is like literally the exact same version of the previous one. Wanda has gone in and out of this costume so many times over the years, it was hard for me to place exactly where in her comic book chronology this specific version was supposed to be from, but I'm pretty sure it's meant to be her like children's crusade and Avengers vs. X-Men era. The Children's Crusade was a story that occurred during Wanda's prolonged disappearance after M-Day and it ushered in her return to the Marvel comics. Wiccan and Speed suspected that they might be her reincarnated children, which ends up being true. So they and a bunch of others hunt Wanda down in Latveria, where she's amnesiac and engaged to Doctor Doom. Eventually, she gets her memories back, and it's proven that Wiccan and Speed indeed are her kids, so she calls off the wedding to Doom and recognizes that she needs to begin healing after what she's done during M-Day. The story attempted to retcon Wanda's big crime by insinuating that Doctor Doom had been manipulating her and causing her to act unruly during Avengers Assembled, but I personally choose to ignore that detail. It's such a stronger storyline if Wanda had indeed acted of her own volition during her crazy days and wasn't just being some supervillain's puppet. Retconning Wanda's accountability and her wrongdoing diminishes the overall role she played in that, which I guess was done in a way to make her likable again. I found it actually made her seem lesser. I felt like it took away her autonomy and her strength of a character and just made her another female superhero who was bent to the will of a man. Even though what Wanda did was horrible, sometimes good people do horrible things, and it's all about how they live up to the consequences of those actions that really demonstrates who they are as characters. I think Wanda has been doing a great job serving her penance, but to shift the blame mostly to Doctor Doom gives her the sense of like having this weird get out of jail free card, and it totally belittles all the efforts that she's been going through to make nice with the mutants ever since. After she returned to the Avengers fold, she again found herself opposite the X-Men during the Avengers vs. X-Men event. The Phoenix Force was coming back to Earth in order to fulfill its destiny of fusing with the mutant messiah Hope Summers, and the Avengers wanted to take Hope away in order to supervise the ordeal, but the X-Men refused, so naturally a big fight happened between both teams. Wanda's involvement comes when she fights with the Phoenix Five, and later when she combines her power with hopes to banish the Phoenix Force by coining the new phrase, No More Phoenix. So original. It was fun watching Wanda team up with Hope to do her part in trying to reconcile things with the mutant population, but it was even funner watching her and Hope fight. The most recent time she was seen wearing this costume was after the first Hellfire Gala, when she was killed and Magneto was put on quote-unquote trial for it. I use the term loosely because nothing about that miniseries was a Magneto trial. By the time she was resurrected, she had manifested a pocket dimension for all mutants to be eligible for resurrection, regardless of the Cerebro backup status. And because of that act of generosity, she's finally gone from being slandered as Wanda the Pretender to becoming Wanda the Redeemer, and is now ever hailed as a welcomed guest to Krakoa. So, in terms of this outfit, as I said, it's basically exactly the same as the previous one. The only real difference that I can spy is that it's a slight modernization of the bathing suit, with some detail added onto it that gives it a bit more texture and shape. I like to think that this is a reinforced bathing suit that makes her a bit more bulletproof than usual, but who knows if that's the intent. I think these slightly new details are an improvement, as they do give her more of an armored look, and if the girl's gonna be fighting evil in a leotard and a bathing suit, then she might as well make it as structured as possible. Number 3, Hellfire Gala. The first Hellfire Gala was a very exciting time. Such a fun excuse to discuss mutant fashion for absolutely no reason at all. The execution of the event was a bit meh, but overall it was an exciting and novel idea. Then Marvel did it again, exactly one calendar year later. This really dulled the spark of the original one for me, but at the very least they kept the event to being a one-shot issue instead of drawing the night out over various titles, and it definitely worked better in a single issue. Unfortunately, we didn't get a ton of mutant fashion for the second one, and instead, for whatever reason, we were treated to what Avengers and other Marvel heroes would wear. 
Why this was relevant to an X-Men event is beyond me, but regardless, one of the other heroes who got the Met Gala treatment was the Scarlet Witch. As an honored guest this time around, she was welcomed to trip the Hellfire Fantastic in her full regalia all night long. She didn't really do too much at the event, but she was seen partying with her half-sister in name only, Lorna Dane. And then when it came time to announce this year's new team of X-Men, which is another annual tradition I've learned to loathe, Wanda served as the Speaker of the House and told everyone who their new heroes would be. The Hellfire Gala outfits can be hit or miss. Some of them have been absolutely stunning, and others have just been yikes. And sometimes an outfit is so nice and so well received by fans that it becomes the hero's actual new crime fighting outfit for a while. Most notably, this was the case with Storm and Jean, but it turns out the Scarlet Witch has now followed suit as a slightly amended version of this Hellfire Gala outfit serves as Wanda's current costume in her most recent solo series. This series has only really just begun, but so far it involves Wanda running a magic shop and helping people who visit solve mystical problems. So I really like this costume. I think it's very, very pretty, and I like that she's a little bit sexualized in it with her exposed shoulders, but like not totally sexualized in it like during Force Works. I heavily prefer the superhero version over the Hellfire Gala version because even though they are basically the same, I am just never a fan of over ornamentation when it comes to Wanda, so I prefer her simple headpiece as opposed to the super bejeweled one. The best part of this outfit for me is her mystic cape. Similar to how Storm's Hellfire Gala costume had that cloudy cape aspect, which was my favorite part of that outfit, Wanda's starry, cosmic, quasar-like cape here is just the right level of extra for me to swoon over. It totally goes with her character and her power set, and I love when a costume can embody what a character is all about without beating us over the head with it. I don't actually like that the Hellfire Gala outfits become regular season costumes because I think it diminishes their sparkle and their wonder, but if it was going to happen to anyone, then I'm happy it happened to Wanda because I actually really do think that this one works well for her as a main costume. It's practical without being too over-the-top fancy, but the design is still very specific and unique so that it stands out as a winner amongst a lot of the other fashion flops. Number two, Dark Scarlet Witch. Now this is costuming, baby. The Dark Scarlet Witch was a byproduct of one of the many times Wanda snapped, and it happened during her tenure on the West Coast Avengers. She had become estranged from the Vision and was still reeling from losing her children and having been brainwashed into being a bride of Set when Magneto came a-knockin'. He was looking to reform the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and I guess the time was just right for Wanda, and she agreed to go with him, and she turned out this brand new evil witch personality. She totally turned on her fellow Avengers and formed this crazy new bloodlust for humanity, and her power increased like a thousandfold. Ultimately, the Avengers defeated Magneto and Wanda, and in the end, it turned out that her change in attitude and power was because she was being manipulated by Immortus for whatever reason. Everything about this costume just works for me, but it's the grandeur of the cape that I'm totally fangirling over. Like, man, I know it's an homage to Magneto, but what business does it have serving this level of high drama? Obviously, the best part is the collar area, with those shoulders starched out to all heaven. And also the color. How often do we get to see someone decked out in this much magenta? It half hurts my eyes, but it's such a bold choice that I can't look away. This costume was such a departure from what Wanda had previously worn, and things only got wilder from here, but I think this one really nailed her evil persona, and I wonder if she shouldn't have been evil for just a bit longer based simply off how fabulous she looked. Number one, The Crossing. While it was certainly not the brightest point in Avengers lore, nor is it probably super fondly remembered by most, I was a huge fan of the Avengers redesigns in the late 90s. Thor wore a harness, the Wasp got supersized, Giant Man started sporting some Havoc X-Factor hair, and Wanda, well, nothing too dramatic happened with her, but she certainly got modernized compared to what she had been wearing up until then. Her hair got relaxed, her sleeves got puffy, and her boots got long. 
This costume came about during the end of Force Works when it was revealed that Tony Stark was a traitor. Wanda rejoined the main Avengers team, where she reunited with the Vision, but the both of them decided that they weren't really interested in taking their relationship back up at this time. Wanda didn't get to spend a whole lot of time in this costume though, because soon after, Onslaught started decimating the Marvel Universe, and she was one of the heroes who banded together to end his threat by sacrificing herself. In the Heroes Reborn era, she had a totally wacky and different costume, and then when she was brought back to the regular universe, she was kicking it old school. So, in effect, this costume really didn't last that long at all. But what an impression it made on me. Maybe it's the Jean Grey of it all that attracted me to it, but I just thought it was the best and most cohesive she's ever looked. I love a campy costume, and Wanda has had more than her fair share of the same iteration of a campy costume over the years, but I think when I saw her in something as clean as this, it really left a mark because it's the first time she's ever looked, um, nice. Not to mention that this costume was obviously one of the inspirations of her newest costume, which I also really like. I just think it's like Wanda decided for the first time to take superheroing seriously in her style and made a functional costume that was also fashion friendly and didn't make her stick out like a big pink and red sore thumb. Anybody who has watched my costume ranking videos before might know my favorite part of this costume, which is of course going to be the puffy sleeves. I'm a known sucker for those, but I don't dislike any specific part of it either. Usually with a lot of her other costumes, I'm able to pinpoint something I don't really enjoy, but I honestly think that everything about this one hits the mark. It's not too much, it's also not too little, and evokes a different kind of attitude within Wanda that's not shy, but not overly aggressive either. I wish she had some better and more notable storylines in this costume, because then maybe it would have a better station in her costuming hall of fame, but instead, it's just there as a weird blip in her career, and all I can say is that it's a blip that I wish had lasted longer. So there you have it, 24 Scarlet Witch costumes ranked. I can't believe how long it took me to get this video out, so if I ever decide to do an adjacent X character costume ranking video again, somebody please talk me out of it. If you like this video and want to see more like it, you can head over to my YouTube channel where there are lots of other costume ranking videos, along with spotlights, reviews, and a bunch of other X-Men related content. You can also visit my website, greatexpectations.com, or follow me on Instagram where I am way more active. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, I want to thank you for sticking through it with me, and I implore you to come back again soon for more great X-Mentations.